Welcome to the Aspen Institute. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Okay, great. So welcome to the latest edition of the Aspen Evaluation Breakfast Series. I'm Dr. Susanna Delaplane, the Associate Director of the Aspen Planning and Evaluation Program. Um, for those of you who are used to seeing our director, David Devlin Fultz, uh, who usually kicks off these breakfasts, have no fear. He's perfectly fine. This isn't a hostile takeover of his breakfast series. Um, he had hoped to make it here today, but he unfortunately had to be in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, and so he sends his regards from afar. Um, in his stead, I'm pleased to have this opportunity to continue the Aspen Institute's efforts to share uh, ideas about how policy change happens. Uh, our program, the Aspen Planning and Evaluation Program, works with clients both within and outside of the Institute to help them assess their contributions to policy change. Uh, now, I just joined the, the team about four months ago, but already I've had the opportunity to work with a broad range of organizations on some really diverse and uh, exciting challenges. So just for instance, uh, we're in the midst of evaluating a uh, continually evolving, multifaceted, multi-year, uh, multi-country, I think I've run out of Maltese um, <laughs> campaign using a, a film series on uh, women's empowerment in the global south. Uh, we're working with clients to develop better indicators for a global coalition, coalition attempting to reduce child marriage. We just kicked off an evaluation of a campaign promoting better protection for clients of microfinance programs around the world. And closer to home, we're working with Aspen Institute colleagues to um, promote new thinking about the role of public libraries in this country. Uh, and I've had the pleasure of working with my rather brilliant colleague, Robert Medina, who is uh, deeply involved in efforts by Univision to promote a better understanding of the common core uh, state standards among Hispanics in the U.S. Uh, so I wanted to note that a, across these very diverse types of projects, one common element in our work at the Aspen Planning and Evaluation Program is that our clients are all seeking to help people create change and uh, make their societies better. And that means helping people know that they can be part of the solution and that they can influence their governments to do better, right? So that requires a certain level of faith that people can actually make a difference and that elected and appointed officials can uh, find solutions that really promote the greater good. And we all sort of are familiar with the data that show that Americans are uh, having a little bit of a faith crisis in our political system and perhaps uh, with Congress most particularly. Um, but today we are very fortunate to have two extraordinary individuals with us um, whose careers really reflect a faith in the American public and in our elected officials. And so uh, first I wanted to say we're delighted to introduce Mr. Sam Daly Harris. Mr. Daly Harris is an advocate, an organizer, and an author who founded the Anti-Poverty Lobby Results in 1980. He also founded the Microcredit Summit Campaign in 1995, and most recently, in 2012, he founded the Center for Citizen Empowerment and Transformation, which helps organizations train their members to create champions for their cause, both in Congress and in the media. Uh, Mr. Daly Harris has earned a great deal of recognition and respect for his work. Grameen Bank uh, founder Muhammad Yunus said, quote, no other organization has been as critical a partner in seeing to it that microcredit is used as a tool to eradicate poverty and empower women than results in the microcredit summit campaign. Um, and Ashoka founder Bill Drayton called Mr. Daly Harris, quote, one of the certified great social entrepreneurs of the last decades. So we're thrilled to have you here today to share your insights, and we congratulate you on the publication of your 20th anniversary edition of your book, Reclaiming Our Democracy. We are equally delighted to have uh, former Congressman Mickey Edwards join us here today. Welcome. Uh, Congressman Edwards is vice president of the Aspen Institute and serves as director of the Aspen Institute's Rodell Fellowships in Public Leadership. Um, he is a Republican member of Congress from Oklahoma from 1977 to 1992, serving as member of the House Republican Leadership and as a member of the Appropriations and Budget Committee. After leaving Congress, he taught for 11 years at Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government and for five years at Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affair. As affairs, as well as serving on faculties of the University of Maryland Law School, Georgetown University's Public Policy Institute, and Harvard Law School. Very uh, impressive. 
Congressman Edwards also actively contributes to public discourse as the author or co-author of four books, as well as weekly political columns for major newspapers. He's also a frequent public speaker and a regular guest on many leading radio and television broadcasts, including, for any fans out there, NPR's All Things Considered. Um, so welcome to you both and to all of our audience members. Thank you for coming. We're really looking forward to an interesting conversation about grassroots advocacy. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Daly Harris, who's going to share his insights into empowering citizen advocates. And I would remind you to please just silence your cell phones. Thank you. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Uh, I really uh, am grateful to everyone who's come. I want to thank the Aspen Planning and Evaluation Program and, of course, uh, former Congressman Mickey Edwards. Uh, I'm going to start uh, with this. Uh, there are basically three main messages in reclaiming our democracy. The first one's kind of obvious, that most people feel hopeless and cynical about making a, a difference with their voice as citizens. The second one's a little less obvious. Over the last 35 years, I've seen people make a profound difference with their government on issues they care about. And the last message is the tough one. And that's the challenge is finding an organization that offers a deep structure of support uh, that's empowering, that's inspiring, that's really transformative. Or said another way, most organizations, when it comes to advocacy, provide their members with a kindergarten and first grade curriculum. You know, click here, the petition will be signed, you're all done, go back to sleep. And so that's the challenge, finding an organization that offers much more than that. Uh, I'm going to begin with five very short stories on our predicament. Uh, I just finished a 30-city book tour, and these are largely taken from that tour, and it points the hopelessness and cynicism, but I tell them not to discourage people, but actually to embolden them. Hopefully you'll see why in a moment. Last fall, I spoke on 15 college campuses, and I told the students that I'd founded results 34 years earlier after I asked 7,000 high school students what the name of their member of Congress was, and fewer than 3% could answer correctly. And so that I asked the college students last fall, 35 years later, the same question, 10% could answer correctly. 90% could not tell me the name of their member of Congress. Story number three, in March I spoke uh, at a senior citizen lecture series in Princeton. They get 200 seniors every two weeks. I went a month early to check it out, and the moderator says, well, a month from now we'll hear from Sam Daly Harris on reclaiming our democracy, healing the break between people and government, and there were chuckles in the room. And the moderator said, yes, this is something we have to work on. But my takeaway is the students are oblivious still. And by this one lonely uh, sample, let's say the seniors in this one sample were what, cynical? Something like that? Story number four. Uh, in March, I spoke at Harvard. I had the honor of meeting a professor of organizing, brilliant person, uh, never heard of results or citizen climate lobby. We, sp uh, we spent um, 20 minutes, he would say, uh, why do you do it that way? And how do people respond when you ask them to, to do this? And how does that work? At the end of 20 minutes, he looks at me and he says, yeah, but Congress is really dysfunctional. And I said, yes, Congress is really dysfunctional, and this year it appropriated $1.65 billion for the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. I said, yes, Congress is really dysfunctional, and this year it appropriated $700 million for maternal and child health programs around the world. I said, Congress is really dysfunctional, but if you roll up your sleeves, do your homework, and get in there, you can make some big things happen. Last story, in April I spoke at Rutgers, and before the lecture I spoke to small groups of students sitting at tables. I walk over to the last table, the last student says, he says, I'm in an honors futures class. With a view to 50 years in the future, what's the most important issue we could work on? 
I said to him, well, my friends in climate change tell me if we don't deal with that, we're toast. My friends in campaign finance reform say if we don't fix that, nothing's going to change. My friends in global poverty tell me it's a blight on humanity. But for me, I said, the most important issue is why so few of us see ourselves as change makers? If we could fix that one, there would be a barrage of people into any number of issues. And so I'm going to tell my story briefly of my move from hopeless to activist, from hopeless to change maker. And the story goes like this. I have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in, I love this part of the story. I have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in music. And I played percussion instruments in the Miami Philharmonic Orchestra in Florida for 12 years and taught high school music. And then I started a citizen lobby group on ending poverty. And people go, well, what was that about? And what motivated that change? And when I look back in my life, um, I, there are two events that really had a particularly profound effect on me. In 1964, I graduated from high school. That's 50 years ago. And uh, just be, I played timpani, actually, in the orchestra at the ceremony. And just before the ceremony started, a flute player came back to the percussion section and told me that a high school fraternity brother, a year younger, had died the day before in a tractor trailer accident in Georgia. It was her next door neighbor, so she knew before I did. Well, I was 17. And you, know, you remember 17? I mean, for me, it was like, I had forever. I mean, mortality was an irrelevant concept. But during that time, the funeral and the mourning period, after the funeral, I went with my friend's younger brother to collect his report card from the homeroom teacher. It really began to dawn on me that maybe I had 17 more minutes or months or years, and the questions of purpose started coming up. Why am I here? What am I here to do? No answers, but all of a sudden, I've got a new batch of questions. Four years later, 1968, college graduation day, the night before Robert Kennedy's assassinated. And it's another one of this, those, what is this life? What is this death? Why am I here? What am I here to do? No answers, but the questions are getting really clear now. Nine years later, I'm a little slow, I'm invited to a presentation on ending world hunger, a presentation by the Hunger Project. And I go to this thing thinking there are no solutions because it's inevitable because if there were solutions, somebody would have done something by now. So I go to this thing and I realize very early the obvious. There's no mystery to growing food or clean water or basic health, literacy. None of that stuff's mysterious. I'm not hopeless about the perceived lack of solutions. I'm hopeless about human nature, people. Well, just never get around to doing the things that can be done. But there's one human nature I have some control over, my own, and my questions, why am I here? What am I here to do? So I start to get involved. And this is the end of the story and where it diverts to where I ended up. Uh, in 1978 and 1979, I just told a piece of this story, I spoke to high school students in Miami, where I lived, in Los Angeles, where I moved. And before I went into the first classroom, I read statements from the US National Academies, Sciences, Food Nutrition Study, and others calling for the political will to end hunger. So I decided to ask high school students the name of their member of Congress. Out of 7,200, fewer than 3% knew. 6,800, just over 97% didn't know. And results, the citizen lobby group started out of that gap. The calls for the political will to end hunger on the one hand, and the lack of basic information on who represented us in Washington on the other. So in the moment, I'm going to discuss really one grassroots-led victory with Congress. Um, of course, that's what's ultimately important and the change that that will bring, and I'll go over that in a moment. But I really want to give some attention to these questions. How did that happen? What are the, some of the secrets to the empowerment of ordinary citizens who can often be so discouraged? What kind of structure of support and ethos are required to ensure breakthroughs. Results began lobbying on child survival issues in 1984. 
1986, the volunteers in about 60 cities, 60 groups, generated 90 editorials, not letters or op-eds, there were more of those, but where the editorial boards wrote these pieces supporting a tripling of the child survival fund from 25 million a year to 75 million a year. We'd send them three at a time, four at a time to, to members of Congress, to uh, um, uh, people in the administration, the UN. At the end of the campaign, the head of UNICEF, Jim Grant, wrote the following handwritten note to us. This is 1986. He said, I want to convey my heartfelt thanks for the unflagging and satisfyingly successful efforts of results on behalf of vulnerable children and mothers everywhere. And you're going to see in a moment what he means there. I thank you in my mind, at least weekly, if not more often, for what you and your colleagues are accomplishing, but thought I should do it at least once this year in writing. And so results continued to lobby for 30 years, year in, year out, 1984 through today, on these maternal and child health programs. And just the bilateral programs alone have increased from 25 million a year in 85 to 700 million a year today. Now, what I'm about to show you, people do not know. This slide and the slide that follows, that in 1984, UNICEF was estimating that um, 41,000 children around the world under five were dying every day from largely preventable malnutrition and disease, things like measles coupled with malnutrition. And the latest report from UNICEF came out a couple of weeks ago, tells it that the 41,000 a day has plummeted to 17,000 a day. If you ask most people, you know, how's the world going, they'll give you some variation of it's going to hell in a handbasket and have no clarity whatsoever about this or this next one. Since 1990, the world has saved almost 100 million children's lives, including 24 million newborns. That part, that's the part that people don't know and need to know, this kind of progress. And results volunteers have been at the center. They didn't do it all but was at the center of the advocacy since 1984. So um, at, in 2013, former deputy executive director of UNICEF was quoted in a New York Times article as saying, to a great extent, it was because of the receptivity created by results that the US funding for child survival increased so dramatically, starting in the mid 80s, and, and that led many other countries to come on board. So what's it take to empower citizens like this? I'm going to go over it a little more deeply a little later, but one of the pieces of the structure of support is an organizing strategy that most advocacy efforts either don't understand or don't have the discipline to follow. Most NGO advocacy efforts fail to provide a single legislative focus. Now, I don't mean a single mouse click focus, but a deeper engagement focus, but developing a legislative agenda that's inspiring and focused keeps staff and volunteers from flitting from issue to issue and instead allows them to drill down deep on just one issue and de develop deep relationships with members of Congress and the media. And I'll say more about this in a moment, but let's take a look at how this, this has been used more recently. In 2007, Results volunteer Marshall Saunders decided to launch an initiative addressing climate change. He had seen an inconvenient truth three times in 10 days. He went to Nashville with a thousand others to learn to do the slideshow. He went home to San Diego and he led it 43 times. And early on he said, I realized I was giving people 98% the problem and 2% what they could do about it, and that they couldn't change enough light bulbs or buy enough Priuses to make up for what the government was or wasn't doing. He even said, one morning I was drinking my coffee and reading the paper, and I noticed an article saying that Congress had appropriated $18 billion in fossil fuel subsidies, and I'd convinced 18 people to change their light bulb that day. He said, this is never gonna work. So he asked me to coach him, in uh, starting CCL. Uh, I've worked with them for seven years. They've grown from nothing to 200 chapters. 
Let's look at, uh, at a few of their achievements to get a sense of going way beyond the mouse click, this deeper advocacy. In 2010, their volunteers in the US and Canada generated 36 letters to the editor, published. Look at the bottom. In the first eight months of this year, their volunteers have, have had 1,486 letters to the editor published. In 2010, their volunteers had 105 meetings with members of Congress, Canadian Parliament, or their staff. At the bottom, uh, in the first uh, eight months of this year, they've had 792 such meetings. If you want greatness, if you want greatness from volunteers, you have to provide a great structure of support. And one of the missing pieces or pieces of the puzzle is an em empowering monthly conference call. And here's how you can do that. Lots of groups are doing webinars or conference calls. Here's how you can do that in a disempowering way. And here's how you can do it in a, an empowering way. So the first part is a guest speaker. Most groups leave this. Le I'm going to give you three components, all of which most groups leave out. So the first one is a guest speaker. Most groups would have their staff do the webinar every month. No guest speaker, no member of Congress invited, no outside expert. But if they do have a guest speaker, the other disempowering way to do it is to have the speaker talk for the entire 25 minutes. That makes everyone around the country a bump on a log. No interaction, no Q&A. The empowering way to do it is insist that the speakers speak for 10 minutes and have 15 more minutes for interactions, question and answer, more empowering, more energizing. Here's the next thing most groups would leave out. Uh, that's some grassroots victories. Uh, first of all, they wouldn't do it. And if they did do it, what people would normally do is just share the victory, not the struggle. So for example, somebody might say, we met with our member of Congress yesterday. It was a blast. We can't wait to do it again. But they leave out that it took 11 phone calls to get the meeting, that they had to meet with the district director first, and that they were, their knees were knocking before they went into the meeting. If you leave that out, then people around the country are listening and going, we've made two calls already. Uh, maybe we should give up on this and go to something else. If you include it, people around the country are going, we've only made two calls so far. I guess we've got nine more to go. Let's get on it. And, we, and you know, it's much more empowering. The last one, well, practice in being more articulate. Again, most groups would leave this out. And if they included it, they, the disempowering way is to, let's say, do a role play of a call to a congressional aide or whatever, and it's horrible, awful. But all anyone on the call can say is, thank you so much for volunteering. You were so, everyone knows it was a stinker. I mean, it's not empowering to hear a crummy role play and there's no progress. The empowering way is to have some real coaching and insights in how to make the talk better. So uh, what's um, all of this look like at the individual level? I'm gonna close with this. I'm gonna read a little excerpt uh, from one of the new chapters. Uh, the woman I'm quoting here, her name is Ellie Sparks. When she wrote this, she lived in uh, Richmond, Virginia. When she wrote this, her congressman was Eric Cantor. Uh, the newspaper is the Richmond Times-Dispatch. Ellie said, when I started with Citizens Climate Lobby, I was suffering from climate trauma. I would read Bill McKibben's birth, book, Earth, and I would weep at home, and I would weep at work. And then she joined Citizens Climate Lobby, and um, 18 months later, she was co-leading a workshop on uh, getting relationships with members of Congress and editorial writers. So here's how she starts it. Our director, Mark Reynolds, likes to say, we're betting the farm on relationships. Then he tells us we need to build relationships with members of Congress and editorial writers. Most of us CCL volunteers have never done that before. What in the world is, does a relationship with a member of Congress look like? How do we connect with an editorial page editor? Some of us have found models for th those relationships in other parts of our lives. Gary in Boston uses the model of a work relationship. I love reading this next section on college campuses. My relationship model is different. I adore romantic relationships. 
So I use romance as my model. That first meeting with the editorial writer, it's like a blind date. Only you've decided ahead of time you're going to marry this fellow. You're going to be sweet and interesting, not too intense. If it doesn't work with the editor, you're going to marry one of his friends at the newspaper. The business editor, environment writer, city editor, someone at this paper will find you interesting and compelling. It's just a matter of being persistent until you find the right connection. I see the relationship with a member of Congress as an arranged marriage. If you live in her district, the member's aide has to meet with you. That's what our congressman's legislative director told us in January, two and a half years ago. We've met nine times with the ledge director. We schedule 45 minute meetings with him. He keeps us for well over an hour. He doesn't want us to leave. Why? Because a good arranged marriage starts out cold and slowly heats up over time. That's different from a love natch that starts out hot and slowly cools down. I see, I love this, I see the editorial writer as a painter. His canvas is the editorial pages. His palette is filled with letters to the editor, op-eds and editorials. I'm his muse, model. Who talks like this? <laughs> Certainly someone who's cynical and, and, and uh, turned off by political action does not. I'm his muse, model, and assistant. Uh, I want him to fill his canvas with colors I like, so I'll have my group send three to five letters to the editor whenever the opportunity arises. That's how you get 1,486 letters published in uh, eight months. Um, the more colors I put on his palette, the better chance of having him pick one or two of my favorite colors. And here's the last paragraph. It's sheer genius. She says, during our conference two years ago, I met with 20 congressional offices. I met with many folks whose view of the world was very different than mine. Going into their offices was hard. I had to let go of a lot of emotional baggage. I could no longer judge them or hold hostility in my heart towards them. I had to let go of my fear of climate change and my fear that they wouldn't listen to me. I had to center myself in love, releasing fear and centering in love, this is sacred and profound work, end of quote. I think if I asked normal people to meet with 20 congressional offices over three days, they'd see it as hard work or dirty work. She sees it as sacred and profound. I think that's something that we all need to uh, aspire to. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for some wonderful insights and experiences that you shared from your work. I want to invite uh, Congressman Edwards to pose a few questions to you uh, to start our conversation going, and then we'll open it up to the audience for questions. But I thought we were supposed to go on and on and on and let there be bumps on the law. You can do that, that as well. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, first of all, Sam, I want to, I, 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 I love your book, and, and I love the work you, you're doing. and, and uh, so I joined Susanna in, in welcoming you to the Institute. We're glad to have you here. A um, couple of thoughts. Uh, first, uh, that I had then a, a question I want to kind of challenge you with. Uh, the, the thought was that, that I really liked, uh, obviously, coming uh, from a former member of the House, that your emphasis on reaching out to members of Congress, because uh, so many people who are in the change world the advocacy world, focus on the executive branch. Uh, it's a very interesting branch. Uh, the president, you know, gets a helicopter and <laughs> has Easter egg parties. You know, but, but, you know, most of the power in our government is in the Congress, in the legislative branch. And so uh, the fact that you have put so much focus on getting people to meet with members of Congress and, and work with them is great. The other thing I, I noticed in looking through your book is uh, uh, your reference to uh, a couple of Republican friends of mine, Dan Lundgren and, and, uh, and John Miller, and so, so many people in the uh, advocacy world, uh, if they are conservatives, only talk to Republicans, and if they're liberals, only talk to Democrats, uh, and they lose a lot of the, the opportunities, mm -hmm. because you know, there, there are people who are in Congress who want to make change. You know, they, they share the same basic values. 
even if they have differences uh, over how to get there. And so I, I thought your approach, uh, which was not narrow, it was not, you know, we're only going to go call on, uh, uh, you know, a, a liberal head of some department. I, I thought it was great. It was well done. So here's the challenge. Okay. You, uh, you ask students uh, who their member of Congress. You could have asked them almost anything, and they would know nothing. They, they, you know, the, the amount of literacy about government and how it works and how you can affect it uh, is just mind-boggling. So is there something else besides, uh, you, you get these people and you get them empowered, but how do you create a bigger pool of people who not only are upset about things, but who understand the system, who understand how to make change and why to make change? Because, uh, I mean, you can empower them, but if you walk into a classroom or you walk into any kind of a group and nobody there knows how the government works, nobody, they, they haven't had civics courses, they haven't studied critical thinking, they don't know. how do you do anything about that? I mean, how, how do you create a bigger pool of people you can yeah. work with? That's a great, great question. I mean, I have to say that, first of all, asking a group of students or whomever who their member of Congress is, is a very low level kind of question. I mean, even if 100% knew, are you doing anything right. with it? Uh, so that's a con constant challenge. I mean, we always try and piggyback if there's an article or a, a, a documentary on PVS or something that's generating some interest, maybe all of a sudden there's a few more people who've woken up to I want to do something. But it, that's a really big challenge and that's why all of the groups that I've been working with, Results, Citizen Climate Lobby, Peace Alliance, they put a lot of emphasis of getting out on the road and getting inviting teams so that it's not three people in the room but that they can talk to a larger group. And then, you know, when it comes to learning how Congress works, there's nothing like A, meeting with your member, then B, knowing when it's authorizing and when it's appropriating and what the next action is. But it, it isn't there a, uh, a systemic problem here too? So, so should some of the focus be on changing the public education system so that uh, people don't arrive at that point not knowing yeah. anything? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and helping to stir people's um, ideas about uh, what matters. So, for example, one of the things, and, and uh, uh, I tend to uh, favor the, the idea of a common core, but one of the things in the common core that's a little disturbing is that the advice to uh, people who teach English uh, is to focus on uh, nonfiction. Well, I mean, it's great if you get a lot of data you know, but what you need to do is get people with a heart, right? You need, you need them to have a, uh, a sense of responsibility, a sense of moral uh, direction. So part of it is making systemic changes, and part of sure. it is, you know, one of the things I write about is in terms of uh, our election system, our primary system, and, and so forth, the campaign finance system, you know, so that you, your volunteers can do a lot of work, but unless you make systemic changes, probably it's going to yeah. not yeah. work. So, so Talk a little bit, one of, one of the stories uh, you emphasized up here that talk about the successes too, and, and you did some of that. One of the stories that, that I was really interested in is the work you did on IFAD, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, and because I was on the subcommittee that actually uh, worked on that, I was probably Feeling one, of your, some I, pressure. I was one of your targets. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, so give a little bit about the history of the changes that you made at IFAD and how that went about. Well, at, at that time, and this is, goes back a, a, a couple of decades, there was a funding squabble between the U.S. and the oil-producing countries, OPEC. And, um, and the US, so the U.S. was going to cut its contribution to this fund. And that, in that particular campaign, results of volunteers generated 28 editorials uh, supporting it. Uh, but what was interesting for me in all of that is it was during that campaign in 1985 that the International Fund, IFAD, sent us three videos of programs they'd worked with. And one of the videos was a Dutch documentary about a little bank in Bangladesh giving microloans called the Grameen Bank. Now this is 
21 years before Muhammad Yunus receives a Nobel Peace Prize. So for us, a bigger deal during that time was that we made, through IFAD, made that connection to Grameen Bank, and a couple of years later, we're lobbying on microfinance legislation and, uh, and doing that kind of work. Yeah. That w was the person you, you uh, worked with at Harvard. Was that Marshall Gans? It was. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Any of you who have not read Marshall Gans's work, you, you yeah. really should. Brilliant. He great. Worked with Cesar Chavez and, yeah. and uh, great organizer. But yes. So what, what is, uh, what's the, the next big challenge? What is, when, when you're, uh, I, I know, you know, this, you could go around this room probably and get 20 different answers and each person would say, no, mine's a bigger challenge. Right, right. More important. Well, but where, where do you see that, that your focus needs to be and these volunteers' focus needs to be primarily? Well, primary. I'm going to answer it maybe a little differently okay. than you might be expecting it. Uh, in, a, in a sense, the big challenge for me is, is convincing NGOs that their volunteers are capable of more than mostly the mouse click. Uh, and I go to NGO meetings, non-governmental organization meetings, with a list of five NGO attitudes that kill citizen empowerment and transformation. One is you can't, these are direct quotes from groups I've met with. Uh, one is you can't ask volunteers to do very much because they'll go away if you do that. Well, certainly you can't ask most of them. Another one, I was in the UK uh, this year and I put the second one up and a, a woman from this massive UK NGO said, that's us, that's us. And th it was, uh, we can have our volunteers write letters to the editor or op-eds because they'll get it wrong and misrepresent the organization. And I said, yeah, if you give them a kindergarten and first grade curriculum and then ask them to write a letter to the, they're gonna get it wrong. But if you give them something much richer than that, then they won't get it wrong. And so um, if the educational system in, as ter in terms of civic education is broken, then kind of my next cut at it is the groups that people will re meet when they get out of school, let's say, the, and the, the CARES, the Save the Children, the Oxfams, the Friends of the Earth, the uh, Sierra Clubs. And it's, it's in institutions like that where, you know, that too often what's offered is, is, well, it's kind of, I say, they see the hopelessness and cynicism and offer programs congruent with it. If most of my members are pretty much busy and hopeless, then I'll give them what busy and hopeless people would do, which is not, not too much. There is uh, a movement on, it's been going on actually for a number of years, but it's gaining strength, uh, and the Aspen Institute is working in this area which is to uh, get more and more young people to give a year of their lives to public activity, mm -hmm. public service. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, do you, what do you think? Is that, is that well, I mean, I, I think that's great. And you great. can make your great use of those people, right? Yeah. yeah. First of all, that's great. And of yeah. course, when I was in high school many eons ago, you know, th things like that weren't going on. And so, not in any big way. And so I think that kind of thing is great. The challenge that I have with it is you can walk into one of those great programs, uh, I think civically illiterate, and walk out of it after a year of great volunteerism, equally civically illiterate. So, I mean, for me, the challenge is that the volunteerism, the service learning, is also is very much uh, divorced from who am, who, who am I as a citizen. I, there's a a quote from Apollo astronaut Rusty Schweikert. Uh, he said, we aren't passengers on Spaceship Earth. We're the crew. We aren't residents on this planet. We're citizens. The difference in both cases is responsibility. Well, most people see themselves as passengers, not crew. And so what are the systems that shift that uh, and allow that to um, and, and, and uh, on, on that same line, one of the differences between the United States and the countries that came before uh, is the one thing that does make us exceptional uh, is that in America, 
uh, we are citizens, not subjects, and the difference being that governments tell their subjects what to do and citizens tell their governments what to do. So I want to find out what these citizens want their government okay. to do because um, somebody wise named Harris, I think it was, you know, said you don't want to do all the talking and have everybody else just listen. Sure. So, uh, you know, your turn. And uh, there's a microphone, right, yeah. uh, for people who want to... Uh, Jump in really quick. So yeah. we're going to run a microphone. So if you'd like to uh, ask a question of either gentleman, we encourage you to ask either or. Um, just wait for the microphone to come to you so that um, so that everyone at home can can hear your question. Uh, so does anyone want to start us off? Back here. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, hi. Uh, Introduce hi. yourself. Hi. Uh, thanks very much, John Oldfield with Wash Advocates. I don't think I need a mic, do I? Yes, yes you do, because it's being televised. Okay, great. Um, yeah, first of all, Sam, thank you. As all, I'm, I'm inspired, and I want to read you one quick thing. I gave a presentation a few days ago on this with Patty Simon, the widow of the late Senator Paul Simon out in Illinois. One member of the audience said, thanks for the presentation and all that stuff, some of the most effective citizen lobbying that I've seen, and I, I give you full credit for that. This is your book and lots of uh, book you know, earmarks here and notes I've taken. And then the key word that this guy wrote me is, you got me. I will write Durbin, Kirk, and Yurt Shimkus. That's it. So I'm inspired by that, and you get full credit for that. Question, actually, for, for both of you is, I, I run an advocacy group that has very limited resources for safe drinking water and sanitation, and we're constantly struggling with how to prioritize the tangible, specific asks. So what's, uh, there's probably not a right answer for this, what's more important to invest our resources in? Letters to the editor, op-eds, phone calls, emails, collectivism, uh, in-district meetings, DC meetings, and I guess I'd ask the question to both of you because you've been on all sides of this equation. If you can help me prioritize just a bit. Thanks. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, you know, uh, uh, first of all, I, whenever I hear what you just said, something like that, I always think about, number one, going back to the guy in Illinois who said, you got me, I'm in. What kind of structure of support is he or she in? You know, what will sustain the I'm in? Or does I'm in, you know, kind of peter out after a few weeks or months? So that's my kind of first question. Um, I would urge you to, like, you know, you kind of said we don't have the resources to do the whole full-blown deal. What, sh how should we pri prioritize? There's a part of me that would urge you to find a way to just do a little pilot where you offer this kind of structure of support ongoingly to five groups in five cities only uh, and test it out. I mean, I, uh, I certainly would uh, urge the face-to-face -face with members of Congress by well-informed and well-briefed citizens over the other asks, but you know, some of these are stepping stones to the face-to-face -face meeting. Um, so uh, yeah, the, the more in-person, up close and personal, the more difference it, it can make and more potential for change. Yeah, let, let me, uh, first of all, I'm glad you uh, met with uh, Paul Simon's uh, widow. Uh, uh, I don't know if you got to meet Sheila Simon, Paul's daughter, who's the Lieutenant Governor of Illinois uh, and is actually part of the Aspen Institute program that I run uh, and is equally, you know, committed to these kinds of issues. But uh, the only thing I would add uh, here to what Sam said is, you know, uh, it's kind of the, uh, uh, the seduction part of the, the uh, story you wrote about, you know, if you've got all these different ways, uh, calling individually on uh, a legislator is, is better and more direct than the letter to the editor. You do the things you can, but, but the, the closer you can get to actually appealing to the decision maker, the better. Uh, you want to do all of it, uh, but whether you start with talking to the legislator or move your way up to talking to the legislator, that's going to be the, the most important part of it. Yeah. Um, next. Hi, I'm, I'm Meredith Dotson. I direct the U.S. poverty-focused uh, work of results. Um, I would urge you to check out Google Congressional Management Foundation because they did a survey of congressional staff which reinforces this get face to face with your member of congress but then you have the data that says you know 96 or 97 percent of congressional staff say that that is the action that has the most influence so when you're kind of 
giving folks the structure of support and supporting them to get that face-to-face -face meeting in a district, you can tell them, Here's, here are the folks who run, we're kind of on Capitol Hill saying this is the most effective thing you can do. Because it's hard the first time you do it, it's, an, it's a little scary, and it's incredibly exciting. So um, I want to go back a little bit to the kind of service and year of service push, um, because even more so in our US poverty focused work, but more and more in our global poverty focused work, there's a lot of folks who are doing service um, in their own community or going abroad and doing service projects. And it strikes me how service, you know, volunteerism is going up and is even kind of mandated for some schools and that sort of thing, yet this kind of sense of disengagement with the political process, if anything, is going down. You know, maybe it's on the rise now. And, and I'd urge Aspen, if, as you're engaging in this push, I mean, AmeriCorps, we recruit, you know, there are folks who come to us who are AmeriCorps volunteers who basically are like, I'm not allowed to do this while I'm serving and, and while I'm in my service. So it's the way that sometimes these year of service structure programs are structured, not only are they not empowering folks to learn about civic engagement, they're actually telling people they can't do it while they're learning. Um, but if you could talk generally about how do you, how do you flip the switch when folks are doing, for instance, service or caring about an issue? It's still really hard to often get them to kind of take the next step of engaging in, in advocacy or something beyond that, um, in part because of the cynicism. I, I'm, so I'd love any insights you have on, you know, especially with the service focus that you all are working on of how, to, how you can bridge that so that people are taking that, that work and then engaging in broader political change. Well, I, you know, I, I, I'm not part of that program, but uh, I, let me just add to that. If you have a real push for people to, uh, young people to get out and, and give to the community, uh, they're going to be looking for something to do. And that, that's a great pool. Everybody's saying, what, what can I work on? And, and you need to get into that. Also, a great many universities have programs where they have their uh, students going out and working in, in projects and in volunteer activities. And that's a place to go out and, and find help because they're, they're fishing around. You know, you know I, I'm being asked, I've got to report to my professor what I've done. You know, what can I do? You know, go out and, and uh, recruit. Uh, actively there there's a big base of people out there looking for something mm -hmm. to do so you know but I you know I I think you make a very good point about the whole city your kinds of ideas but uh, uh, you know we'll leave other people who are listening to this will be able to answer that right? yeah. Yeah. hi thank you um, I'm a witness to seeing what a yeah, citizen... Can you identify yourself? Oh, I'm Len Chorzy. I'm a, a results uh, advocate for 35 years, or since ever since Sam started. Since I had black hair. Black hair. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my question really is that Bart Giamatti uh, quote that you, you might be able to do better than I, that we all know such passionate people that care, and yet that, that cynicism and that apathy that surfaces when you talk to people about getting involved on a government level, that the disdain for politics, which is probably more apparent now than it was 35 years ago, building the pool, as you were talking about, there are s there's a mammoth amount of passionate people that really want to make a difference but can't get past the apathy or the cynicism or their disdain for politics. And I guess I, I ask you both to address that. Let me try the Bart Giamatti quote. I may not be able to pull it off. This is when he was not baseball commissioner yet. When he was, he was still at, at Yale. Yale. Yeah, he, he said, what concerns me most today is the way we've disconnected ideas from power in America and created for ourselves thoughtful citizens who disdain politics and what politicians do. That's the ballpark. Uh, of the quote, and um, yeah, it's it, it's endemic. Um, uh, I, you know, I I think uh, I forget. I think you said it. There are people out there looking for something to do, and there's this. We need some kind of better matchmaker uh, because they're not easy for us to find, and we're not easy for them to to find. And when I talk about these structures of support, I think about the 
results.org or citizensclimatelobby.org or peacealliance.org is places if people could find those groups uh, on global and domestic poverty, on climate change, on peace issues, they could s fit into a structure that would feed them power and would nurture them. But um, I, I love this quote that's attributed to Mark Twain. Uh, the two most important days of your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. And I think in a real quiet moment, everyone would agree that part of the why is giving back, contributing, leaving the campsite cleaner than we found it. But that desire is smothered by layers of hopelessness and discouragement and cynicism. And when that can be released, then uh, the natural desire to give back is, is, can be expressed. The, uh, the opposite of politics is the Kremlin. You know, politics, you know, one of the things that Sam talks about uh, that, is, that is so great uh, is, is the need to inspire, not to just motivate, but to inspire. Having a political system where, where people with different views have very vigorous debate and, and, and think seriously about alternative proposals and have a chance to influence people they selected, you know, to, to make a, a decision that they will like uh, is, is the heart of democracy. Politics is what makes democracy. A and so uh, the more you go out and you know, fight against the cynicism and say this is how you are empowered to go out and reach out to the people that your community has elected to make a change. You know, a, a lot of the people who feed the cynicism want to just be able to, they don't want to do the work. They want to be able to snap their fingers and get the results they want. Uh, and that's not the way it works in democracy. There's 312 million of us with a lot of different views. And you have to work to kind of make your view prevail. You're not going to find a consensus. You have to find compromise. So there's ways to do it. And, and getting people to understand the political system is what makes us a real democracy. And, and uh, it, it's doable. And I think you have done a great job. And I think the, the examples you showed before, not about the problems, but about the solution, Progress. the things that have worked, uh, is, is really inspiring. Right. Thank you very much. Um, two really brief Introduce questions. Yourself. Sure. My name is Robert Osberger. I'm an investor and worked with the Securities and Exchange Commission for about 15 years. So my first question is, looking back at Occupy Wall Street, which was a dynamic, fabulous, incredible media, media coverage event. I sat there and watched it all the time. But the titans of Wall Street just sat there in the street, looked down at these people, and said they're not doing anything that's going to cause us any problems because they weren't attacking their hedge funds, their tax, their, their due, uh, different tax rates, and things like this. So I'm not going with a particular idea. I'm just saying is that I felt so sad that all of this energy was being dissipated because nothing has really been changed since that event. If you look back at it, everything is still the status quo. And the second thing is for the congressperson is if you went, if, t if when you were in office, what would really move you? If it would a petition of something like someone said, I got a thousand voters in your in your district that would, that have signed this petition, hand delivered to you, would that make your staff be willing or you more willing to actually face this group, meaning it just negotiate or whatever, meet with them. I, I'm just kind of getting a feeling of how does Congress, what really is that tipping point there? And thank you for, for the wonderful uh, presentation. Well, a couple of things. Uh, I, I just, a couple of days ago, I gave a talk to, uh, at BYU, and it was a great opportunity. I talked about the Constitution. We had 5,000 people in the basketball arena, and it was, it was great fun. But then, then I went to uh, uh, talk in a couple of the classes there, and uh, in one of them, which had a pretty large group of, of students, I said, well, how many of you have ever, when, you, when you're a member of Congress, came to your district and had one of the regular neighborhood meetings, town meetings, you know, how many of you showed up? One person held up, held up his hand. Uh, and it's person to person. So when, when your state legislator, your, your member of Congress, you know, comes back, has a meeting, and, you know, be there. Be there. How, how did I start talking about bipartisanship? It was because I had a uh, town meeting in, in my district in Oklahoma City. Uh, a lot of people were there. 
and I gave some kind of political excuse about I was a Republican, Democrats wouldn't let me do something. Somebody got up in the room, one person said, I'm so sick and tired of hearing Republican, Democrat, you know, everybody in the room cheered and I never did it again. I mean, you, you, if you show up, your, your elected officials will listen to you when you speak directly to them. The, what would af affect me? I would go down to the House floor to cast a vote and I would have gotten a briefing paper uh, from a member of my staff about various issues and commentary. Uh, and if I had a note in there from somebody who Sam had inspired, you know, that made this point for, you know, one of the things for me to consider, that's powerful. Uh, so, you know, more direct reaching, don't, don't, be cynical toward your elected officials. Don't be angry at them. Don't, you know, reach out to them. Make it personal. What was wrong with Occupy? It was totally unfocused. Occupy could not have done more to repudiate everything that Sam was saying because they didn't do any of it. You know, it was just an out. It was just outrage, complaint, whining, angry. You know, uh, and and that's if you had a list of the way not to do it. That, that was it. And, you know, where, where Sam said, give them, give them real stuff and a real goal and a real mission. You know, that works. Well, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, what, one thing Occupy did was very clearly get a message, one message across particularly about yeah. the 99%. Right. That was brilliant in terms of getting it in our brains and in the air kind of thing. What wasn't there was the ongoing structure of support and a plan right. what and do do? what are we going to do about that issue. I mean, some politicians have picked up on that idea and are, are running with it, but where's the grassroots right. support of it? My name is Dan Kahn. I'm, I'm the field director of the Peace Alliance, so we have the privilege of also getting coached by Sam in our, in our grassroots advocacy program. Um, uh, you've you really talked to a lot of, of what I was going to raise, but I guess I want to underline something. Uh, when we talk about the cynicism and difficulty that a lot of people have with government and with government advocacy, um, I'll be a little bit diagnostic. I think a lot of what turns people off can be the, the sense of combativeness and hostility and that there's difficulty getting a straight answer from a politician, that they're sort of shaping the truth against each other. Um, and I, something that I cherish about our approach with, with the Peace Alliance and that, that Sam has really reinforced and that, that both of you have talked about is this emphasis on relationship building. So that people can get in there and make, make different kinds of relationships within politics by approaching their members of Congress, not just with here's my point and this is what I need you to do, but I want to know where you're coming from on this issue. We really coach our advocates in, in being there and listening and we might not convince them or persuade them in that meeting, but we're building the foundation of a, of a connection. And maybe over time, that, that's gonna change some things, whether it's with a Congress member or an editor or with a, a potential ally or adversary. So that's us taking responsibility for shifting relationships in culture, which is what we see reflected from the, the heights of government and it's hard for us to see. And that's also probably in our relationships in our homes and our schools and our families. But it's really frustrating when we see our, our elected leaders quibbling and wasting and, and fighting when we'd love them to be more functional, but it's a, it's a whole systems approach. So I don't really have a question, but if you want to talk to that. Well, I, I actually want to read something that's very related to that, and it speaks to the subtitle of the book, Healing the Break Between People and Government. And uh, I don't know which part of this story to tell, but last fall I spoke at the College of St. Benedict, St. John's University in Minnesota, and before the lecture, there was a book group of faculty and staff and students who'd read the book. And in the book group was a nun who for 37 years had been the librarian at the university. And she had just retired and she was kind of lit up about the book group and such. But we were ending and she said, but I still don't know what to do. My congresswoman is Michelle Bachman. And it was her thing. And so I pulled out this particular prayer, and I'm going to read it in a moment. This is a pr I asked her to take this pr repair prayer and uh, replace uh, the, the congressman's name that's in here with her own. But this is a prayer that a, a volunteer in Houston had written uh, about his congressman, Bill Archer. But what I'm going to read is a volunteer in Atlanta who replaced it with his congressman, Pat Swindoll. And 
It's about healing the break. It's about the issues that you were raising. And they, they, their congressman was one of few who voted against famine aid to Ethiopia in 1985. And they were very embarrassed by it all. And they didn't know how they could work with such a person. So they would start this prayer. And um, it goes like this. Thank you, God, for Pat Swindoll. We know he's a good man and who wants to do right in the world. We know he struggles with the same problems we do, closing our hearts to those who don't agree with us. There are no thoughts or feelings that he has had that we haven't had, and vice versa. We pray for all of us to learn compassion for people in our country and far away, for rich and poor. We pray that Pat and we will be less frightened of each other. We pray our focus will be more to love and appreciate him and less to change him. Help us to remember that sharing love with the world is the highest contribution we can make and will lead us uh, to children being fed and the planet surviving. Forgive our righteousness and anger. Open our hearts and minds to find the next expression of love for Pat that he can receive. End of prayer. And they said we would read this at our meeting and go, yeah, right. <laughs> but they kept reading it. It kind of came in. They said we would go with, uh, uh, there were chat with Pat sessions around the district, which they called spat with Pat, because usually people would have a bone to pick and nothing would happen. But they'd approach with a smile and a handshake and some information that made a difference. And two years later, they went in to ask him to co-sponsor legislation on microfinance. And the leader of this group, Steve Balk, said to his, who would, the woman who would become his wife, said, you know, when he, once he says he'll co-sponsor the bill, I'll ask him if he'll write an op-ed. Sarah said, I think that would be pushing it. They go in. They show him a video. He says, sure, I'll co-sponsor it. And then before they can speak, he says, you know, I do a column in the local paper. Do you think you could help me draft something so we can educate the constituents? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, this is from bag over a head on the Ethiopia famine vote to a real relationship. And the, it started with the volunteers, you know, not when are you going to get fixed? No, let's do some, you know, healing here in ourselves, and then we can better work with you, the member of Congress. You know, I, I'd only add, you know, certitude kills. Uh, and, you know, going in to uh, talk to somebody who uh, has a different point of view than yours, <coughs> having already worked out how you're going to rebut everything they say, you know, it's just going to stop anything from happening. And, and developing the ability to form a real relationship by listening to where somebody else is coming from, why they are where they are, what their concerns are, and trying to find a way that what you're trying to achieve can, can play into what their concerns are, you know, is very empowering. And uh, people on both the left and the right fall into the trap of, of uh, uh, disparaging people who don't see things as brilliantly as they do. Uh, and so um, I, I, I think your approach, and what you just said, Sam, is, is really important to achieving breakthroughs. There are probably a lot of Pat Swindolls. Uh, there are a lot of people on the left who would support things that, that a conservative advocacy group might want. You know, if you get to where you can talk honestly with each other about what you want to see. Hi, thank you so much uh, for the presentation. My name is Jeff Lyle from the United Nations Foundation Shot at Life campaign. Um, the question is to both of you. It seems like whether you're a member of Congress or you have in a grassroots campaign, we're in the relationship of building, we are in the relationship of um, building relationships. We're in the business of building relationships, I should say. Um, so the question is, is once you provide that direct or that robust support and that support is where you get the transformation, that's where you get the um, inspiration. How do you get people to engage with you? How do you get people to engage in that support or first take that step in building relationships? Is it more webinars? Is it getting out and having more town hall meetings? So it's just general idea of how do you get people to first take that initial step in engagement? Thank you. Well, it's chapter, uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, oversimplified, you know, if you, uh, you said shot at life? Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you have uh, 500 stakeholders in Seattle, you know, I would find a host and a little inviting team of folks and hopefully those five on the little inviting team in a call with you would, 
work hard to get 20 friends in the room from Shot at Life and not kind of thing and go out there and do a presentation, not a town hall meeting so much as a lit literal workshop on starting a group and what would be involved in being a member of the group and what you would get, what kind of support and nurturing would you get by being in the, so volitionally starting chapters by finding one of your hosts and building an inviting team and going there and, and doing a presentation whereby the 20 in the room, six raise their hand and say, we're in. Well, let them be clear what they're in on and then deliver it. Don't say we're going to provide this, this, and this, and then not, not provide it kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, let, let me add, I mean, this is straight out of a campaign playbook. So I was, uh, uh, I, I'm a Republican. I was elected in a district that had not elected a Republican since 1928. And my district was 74% Democrat. Uh, and what I would do is if I had come to your house and had any kind of a positive response to my message, the first thing I would say is, will you invite your friends and neighbors over, you know, and so I'd come meet in, with a group in your living room uh, and, and talk a, as a group and, and have at the end of it something specific, whether it's a, a volunteer card or asking for people to take a bumper sticker or whatever. Uh, and so I, I totally agree with Sam, you know, that, that getting the people together in one place and being able to, you know, th th there's a collective action here that begins to happen as uh, you, because one person says, yes, I'm going to be part of that. It puts pressure on the person next to them you know, to, to also say, yes, I can do that too. So that's the best way to do it. I mean, you know, yeah. the, the town meeting, just, just what you do in a campaign. If I could just add one other thing, it related to the what are you going to provide them kind of thing. There was a slide that I took out, uh, it's in the book. There's a small circle on one side of the page that's labeled your comfort zone. And to the other side is a much larger circle labeled where the magic happens. And the question is, are you an organization that helps people move out of their comfort zone and over to where the magic happens? Because that's where the breakthroughs are, and that's where the growth is as an advocate, as a citizen, et cetera. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Josh Joseph with uh, Pew Charitable Trust. And I actually wanted to piggyback on this um, question here and something you said. Um, Congressman Edwards um, earlier. The idea of um, sort of broadening the audience um, and getting people more connected. So along this line, um, people are busy, obviously, or at least they feel busy. I mean, they've got Facebook and a bunch of other things right. to do, right? Um, <laughs> but but they're, they want to be engaged. Yeah. Um, can you give some more specific examples about how you provide opportunities for folks to engage with Activities that they might care about, but at different levels. So meaningful activities at different levels. Not just, I don't have a lot of time, but I still want to do something meaningful. What can I do here as opposed to, you know, writing an op-ed or trying to get someone else to publish one? Something that would, you know, get folks to be in on it, even if they don't have a ton of time. Well, I, I'm, I still want to say that I would, you know, I would urge the mouse clicking to continue. Uh, uh, Paul uh, Loeb, who wrote Soul of a Citizen, once said to me, you know those email peti petition to Congress, they're counted, but they're also discounted. Well, I, but I would urge that to continue with a constant invitation for people to step to another level and to another level. Um, there's this, you said people are busy, and people are busy. I mean, it's like American Idol. Do you know how much time it takes to watch that thing, and, <laughs> and et cetera, et cetera. But um, there's this uh, quote from, um, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, forgetting his name, a former president of Johns Hopkins, who said, amidst the glut of insignificance that engulfs us all, the temptation is understandable to stop thinking. Amidst the glut of insignificance that engulfs us all, the temptation is understandable to stop thinking. The trouble is unthinking persons cannot choose, but must let others choose for them. But to fail to make one's own choices is to betray the freedom, which is our society's greatest gift to us all. Uh, you know, we just have to keep inviting people in to another level and then providing them with something powerful so that it's not like, well, why'd you invite me here? There's nothing going on here. 
No, this joint is jumping. It should be what they get invited to in terms of what's going on. Yeah. So let, let, let me add to this, just um, drawing again on, on the political campaign uh, idea. Uh, so when you're raising money for a campaign, you could send out a letter, you know, to people and say, would you send $25? And, and that's great. Uh, what we would do is send something out and say, we have new television commercials and radio commercials starting. Uh, and if you will send $14.73, it will pay for one, you know, th you know uh, you're, where you're showing people something very specific. That, that they are doing. Uh, we would also, uh, you know, when you had people come in who would volunteer, you don't ever want somebody to sign a volunteer card and then not call on them. You know, so you, so you call them, you bring them in. Uh, we had one person just in charge of being kind of the social chairman uh, among the volunteers at a particular time, you know, so that uh, they all got to know each other. It became a go-to thing to go be there with that group with very specific, you know, these calls and what you're going to say and why you're gonna, why you're going to say it. Uh, a, you know, you are to go to these ten places and do this. Uh, the more specificity where people can actually see what they've accomplished and at the end of the day they can hear from you and the people running that headquarters that you know what they accomplished and you appreciate what they accomplished uh, and it really creates a, f a feeling of teamwork and, and but you get a lot of people in organizations they get a lot of people to sign up and say yeah I'm with you and that's it and you know you, you've got to take advantage of it immediately you know, put them to work with very spe specific things to do. I just want to um, caution everyone that we're going to end at 945 sharp. Uh, so we're going to start to work towards wrapping up. Um, maybe take one more question and then we'll give you a chance for a few final comments before we all adjourn. Okay. Good morning. Thank you so much for your remarks. My name is Cece Fadupe. I'm a fellow health fellow with the International Center for Journalists. And speaking of glut of insignificance, I wonder if you might both address the way that information gets to people now, information is power, and how the clicking helps or hurts people's ability to use information effectively for <coughs> advocacy. Thank you. Well, I, you know, I think generally, I mean, if it's well informed, I think the clicking helps. I, I just, won't, it's kind of like don't stop doing mouse click activism just don't stop there is the point so um yeah i think uh, you know it's it's useful that more and more people are engaged at least to that level how do we take it to the next level is my main question the um back to the campaign analogies i mean so um the one thing the internet would be very good at is reminding people that there's an election and that their vote matters and that we're all together in this. Uh, it's not as good as, at actually getting somebody to the polls. Uh, so you need additional parts to that. You, you need then somebody to go knock on their door to make a phone call and get them actually on the phone and say, uh, we've got a poll watcher at the precinct and they said you haven't been there yet or whatever. Uh, so uh, the the Clicking part, you know, being being online, that that's good. That's great. It's a good way to get information out, but it's not enough. It, it's the beginning of the process, not not the total process. Do you want to wrap up with a few final comments? Well, let me just say something quickly because then let Sam have the final word. Um, what Sam has has really touched on here is that what America is about is about citizens taking charge of what their country is going to do and what our society is going to look like. Uh, and he has shown, I think, uh, a model here for how you get people engaged, but what that model includes going beyond complaints about what's wrong uh, and showing what can be done and having a, a model to sustain, you know, their activities. And what we have to do is all of us go out and get more people encouraged, inspired about changeability and it, it can happen. It's not, it's not hopeless. And the members of Congress, even if the majority, at, whoever holds the majority at the moment, 
don't happen to agree with you and share your point of view, that doesn't mean it's all over and you just wait until after the next election to do something. You, you can make progress now. And so, uh, I mean, that's all I, I, th I thought your book was great. I think the work you've been doing, Sam, is great. Uh, and I'm really delighted that you came to the Institute yeah. to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you. Great. I, I, I'm going to close with uh, a little quick reading from the book. And it's actually a reading about the first editorial I ever generated. Uh, it's a long time ago. I was in LA. I was a substitute teacher starting this grassroots lobby results. Um, we were working on a candidate forum on uh, World Food Day. Uh, and I was meeting with the reporter from the LA Times and I was telling her that TV editorial writers, some of them were saying, we wouldn't do an editorial on this because hunger isn't a state or a local issue. Uh, and then she got really nervous and asked me if I had called the Times. And I said, yeah, we called them, but they wouldn't return our call. And she said, who'd you call? And I said, well, the editorial page editor. And she said, don't call him. Call Kay Mill. She's the only woman at the, on the editorial board. This is 1982. So during a break at the junior high that I was teaching at, I go into a payphone booth. Do you remember payphones? <laughs> uh, and I put my diary on a built-in ledge and I call her up and she says, well, we don't do editorials on days, Labor Day. Let's pick an issue and do one. And so, I pr uh, and so this is uh, the bit uh, that I wanted to read. Uh, my first, uh, I promised to mail materials on key anti-hunger legislation Bread for the World had been pushing and follow up by phone. The fourth period bell rang. I said goodbye and hurried back to my classroom. That telephone call and the editorial that followed altered my sense of myself and what was possible. It was normal for me to distribute 100 photocopies of an action sheet or important article. But when that first editorial appeared, I remembered thinking, not only has the LA Times written this editorial, but they've made one million copies of it, and they've delivered it for us too. How marvelous. My early morning dash to the front yard, you remember the front yard picking up the paper? <laughs> my early morning dash to the front yard to pick up the LA Times was my run to democracy. I realized that I had the right job to make a difference, substitute teacher. I realized that I had the right training to make a difference, music. I realized I had the right bank account to make a difference, nearly zero. I realized that making a difference wasn't a function of any of these. It was a function of commitment and persistence. And so uh, what I really urge people to do is look for the kinds of groups that give you that structure of support and empowerment on global and domestic poverty, results.org, on climate change, citizen climate lobby.org, and on peace issues, peacealliance.org. And really put yourself in some of these Harvards of activism that can help you get moving. Okay, so, um, thanks, you guys, both, for a fantastic uh, conversation. I wanted to mention that we'll be reaching out to you about our next breakfast event, so please stay tuned for that. Uh, and in the meantime, I'd like to give a final round of applause to our wonderful speakers here.